the children who shared into the euphoniums and tubas this morning. This has been a glorious morning of, of worship and music, and I am thankful for those who have shared their gifts with us this morning. Let us pray. Holy and merciful God, calm our hearts, our spirits, and our minds. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart in this space bring honor and glory to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Are you familiar with uh, cowboy or, or old western shows? Uh, Bonanza, Gunsmoke, The Lone Ranger. This genre is not quite as popular as it once was, but, but perhaps you remember how it goes. And if you don't, this is how it goes. There's a, a, a good guy, right, who's set to protect the citizens of Dodge, right? Maybe it's a, a sheriff or, or a marshal or a ranger. And then, and then there's the bad guy. He's a, a bank robber or, or a train robber, something, something sinister like that. Uh, in these cowboy western shows, it's, it's all pretty black and white, right? The, the good guy is clean shaven, he, he rides in on a white horse. The bad guy has a, a scraggly beard, dressed in dark clothing, and he, he rides on a black horse. The plot generally moves forward in the same way. The bad guy does something bad, right? And then the good guy chases him. And in the end, we know that the good guy is always going to catch the bad guy. We just don't quite know how it's going to happen, how he's going to get there. Sometimes, as the chase was going on, as they were running through the Wild West, uh, the good guy would make up posters. And it would have a, a picture of the bad guy's face. It would have his name underneath the picture. And then in, in big, bold letters, it would say, Wanted dead or alive, dead or alive. Uh, the poster suggests that, that this bad guy is such a menace to society that he had to be stopped. If stopping him meant killing him, then so be it. He was wanted dead or alive. Put him in jail or put him in a casket. We don't care, right? Just two simple options. There's not a middle ground there. If he is dead, he is not living. If he is living, he is not dead. The sheriff, the good guy, did not really care which option we chose. Those options, again, are, are just black and white. They're cut and dry. But rarely is life this easy, and rarely is the answer quite as simple. In our text this morning, in, in Romans, Paul is proclaiming that there is a third option. It's not just dead or alive, but rather dead and alive. Of course, this text isn't referring to an old Western uh, TV show plot or the capture or wanted poster of a criminal, but rather it's talking about what is wanted, what is desired of a Christian. How is it that, that following after Christ would call one to be both dead and alive? Paul is proposing here that death and life happen together. Uh, we just heard the text read, we must consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. How can this be? How can one be both dead and alive? Our text this morning gives us an invitation to live into the promise of our baptism. We just baptized two beautiful young children, and, and we celebrated that through that sacrament of baptism, we are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation. We are given new birth, new life through water and the Spirit. All of this is God's gift to us. Through baptism, we declare that sin and death are not the things that define us. We lay those things to rest, and we declare and celebrate that we belong to God. We can be both dead to sin and alive to the powerful, beautiful work of a life in Christ Jesus. I love the way that the message translation interprets this scripture. When you're studying scripture, I hope that you read a couple different translations. Uh, sometimes it, it opens your eyes up in a, in a new and 
an exciting way. It's like a good thing to do that. The message did that for me this week. This is how that text reads. Again, this is Romans 6, verses 3 through 11. That's what baptism into the life of Jesus means. We are lowered into the water. It is like the burial of Jesus. And when we are raised up out of the water, it is like the resurrection of Jesus. Each of us is raised into a light-filled world by our Father so that we can see where we are going in our new grace-sovereign country. Could it be any clearer? Our old way of life was nailed to the cross with Christ, a decisive end to that sin-miserable life. No longer at sin's every beck and call. What we believe is this. If we get included in Christ's sin-conquering death, we also get included in his life-saving resurrection. We know that when Jesus was raised from the dead, it was a signal of the end of death as the end. Never again will death have the last word. When Jesus died, he took sin down with him, but alive he brings God down to us. From now on, think of it this way. Sin seeks, speaks a dead language that means nothing to you. God speaks your mother tongue, and you hang on every word. You are dead to sin and alive to God. That is what Jesus did. What a powerful translation. When Jesus died, he took sin down with him, and but alive, he brings God down to us. You are dead and alive. Of course, being dead to sin doesn't mean that we never make mistakes. It doesn't mean that we never sin. It doesn't mean that we come to a point in our lives where our relationship with God is perfect and we don't need to work on growing spiritually anymore. But it does mean that we do not allow sin and capital D, death, to define who we are. I had a, a seminary professor who would talk about lowercase d, death, and capital D, death, lowercase d, death being the death that, that happens when we lose a life, when, when someone's life is taken away. But, but that capital D, death, was that more pervasive death, that, that death that comes to us when we are mourning and says, curse you all, I will always have the last word. Or, or it's the death that, that creeps in and silently takes pieces of, of life away. Or it, it's the death that takes relationships to one another or to God for granted. It's the sin which separates us from our brothers and our sisters and breaks relationship. It's injustice on the street corner or in the office. Capital D, death is fear for our life, our jobs, our, our families, our future. Being dead to sin means that we do not allow capital D, death, or sin, or fear, or oppression, or bad attitudes, or jealousy, or animosity, unforgiving spirits, doubt, shame, whatever it is. We don't let those things dictate who we are and how we relate to one another, how we relate to God, or how we relate to ourselves. Instead, we die to those things so that we might experience life. I love the way uh, Bishop Willimon puts this. He's talking about this scripture, and he tells this story of, of being appointed in a, a small church in Mississippi. He just says it's a, an ordinary church in Mississippi. He was studying this scripture, and, and he worried uh, that Paul's talk here in, in Romans of baptismal dying was, was too mystical. That, that it wouldn't relate to folks in the real world, and people would have a hard time understanding it. He had a hard time understanding it. So he, he gathered a, a group of folks from the church together and, and sat down with them, and, and he asked them, has anyone here had to die in order to be a Christian? Has anyone here had to die in order to be Christian? First, there was silence. And then they began to share. One man spoke up. He said, I, I thought I couldn't live in a world where black people were the same as white people. When segregation ended, I thought I would die. But I did not. I was reborn. My next door neighbor, my best friend, is black. But something old had to die in me for something new to be born. Dead and alive. Perhaps this can be your lunch 
selfish question today. Is there something in your life that needs to die that you might truly live? Is it a grudge you've been holding on to for years? Is it a, a, an unwillingness to compromise? Is it a, an inflated ego, a, an unwillingness to forgive someone? What is it that needs to be laid to rest in order that you might live? As we die to these things, we are called to celebrate the living Christ in us. We celebrate that the resurrected Christ is the final answer to sin and to death around us. And we celebrate that the resurrected Christ lives in you and lives in me and gives us freedom to experience and to live in peace and in love, in grace, and in joy. We are dead and alive. This week we had over 400 children and 100 adults uh, come to Vacation Bible School. Jenna told you about that earlier. They, they filled up the halls and the classrooms and, and the parking lots, and it was glorious. It was so much fun this week. One of the best parts of, of the day for me was uh, when the children would leave. They'd leave at noon. Uh, you could hear them walking out with their moms and their dads. And the conversation often went like this. The mom would ask or the dad would ask, uh, what did you learn today? Or what was your favorite part of today? The child would respond with stories about crafts and snacks and the Bible story and the songs that they, they sang or, or the raising of money to put a roof on a house. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. All of those, those conversations reminded me of a story that I heard once again about a little girl who was leaving church. She was in, in the car with her parents, and she turned to her mom and dad in the car, and she said, you know, I, I have a question for you guys about what, about what the preacher was talking about today. The parents said, well, we would love to talk to you about that. What's your question? She said, well, I heard the preacher say that God was bigger than you are and that God is bigger than I am. Is that true? mom and dad? The parents said, well, of course that's true. Yeah, that absolutely is true. The little girl thought a moment. She said, well, then I heard that the preacher said that, that God was so big that God could hold the whole world in his hands. Is, is that true, mom and dad? And they said, well, yeah, of course that is true. She thought for a minute. And she said, well, then I heard that God lives inside of you and God lives inside of me. Is that true, Mom and Dad? The parents were a little concerned about where this was headed, but, but they answered, well, yeah, that is true too. God does live inside of us, and God lives inside of you. The girl was silent for a few minutes, and then she, she said, well, then Mom and Dad, if, if God is so big, that God can hold the whole world in his hands. And, and if God lives inside of you, and if God lives inside of me, then shouldn't God show through? Shouldn't he be able to see God? Yes. Yes, of, of course. God should shine through. If we are living, if we are living as though we are not constrained to allow sin and death to have the last word, if we are alive to Christ, if we are alive to grace and love and peace, if we live in the peace and power of God's gift of Christ Jesus, if we live what we declare during our baptism and the baptism of, of children and adults who enter into this fellowship, if we believe and live as though God's grace is, is supreme, as though God is great, that Christ is risen and we are called to live our lives as resurrection people, then God should shine through. God should shine through in how we work and how we live and how we love and how we give. Even in how we die, God should shine through. Vacation Bible School was awesome. To walk through these halls and to hear children and youth and adults celebrating, singing, laughing, dancing, learning about God at work, the workshop of wonders of God in our midst, you could see God shining through. What would our life, our community, our, our homes, our world be like if we could live each day celebrating God at work, the living 
Christ in us and through us. What a magnificent place the world would be if we could allow God to shine through in such a way. Brothers and sisters, you are wanted, dead and alive. May you die to all that is holding you down and be freed to live in the glorious promise of the resurrection. And as you live, may Christ shine through. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may it be. Amen.